In this episode of the Global Travel Channel podcast show, we head to New Zealand to chat to a few of the next generation of Kiwi filmmakers. Hello and welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show. My name is Mark Philpot. On the show, we talk to people from across the world about all things related to travel, from amazing adventures to inspiring stories to the not so well-known destinations. We cover it all. You can find all of our previous podcast episodes on our Global Travel Channel website by visiting www.globaltravelchannel.com. Or you can download our episodes from Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, and a host of other platforms that are noted on our website. The Global Travel Channel is a collaboration between travel writers, photographers, YouTubers, podcasters, and bloggers from across the world. We bring you information that we hope makes your next travel experience an awesome one, no matter where you decide to travel to. You can also find the Global Travel Channel on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So be sure to subscribe, like, and follow us so you can keep updated on our new content postings as and when they happen. You can even now support us through Patreon for as little as the price of a cup of coffee per month. You can help us continue to produce our podcast show. Any contributions are greatly appreciated. Now on to today's show and we're going all the way over to New Zealand. So it's a massive kia ora to all my Kiwi listeners in New Zealand and across the world. And today we're going to be talking to three young men about their adventures as young New Zealand filmmakers. So without any further delay, let's welcome them to the show. So it's a warm welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show to Grayson Straker, Mark Sanderville, and Jordan Stewart in New Zealand. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, how are you? Very well. Kia ora and welcome to the show. First time I've had three guests on one end on the show, so let's see whether we can nail this one. Yeah, no, I've got a good feeling about it. Uh, super excited. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. It's a special occasion for me. I rushed out today and got a box of Buzz Bars and chocolate fish, so I've got those sitting next to me. What about the marmite? Where's the marmite? No, I don't eat that stuff. I gave that up when I was about five. <laughs> now, have you guys ever been on a podcast show before? Uh, so, um, I'm Grayson, and I have not been on a podcast before. I've done nothing like it, so I'm very excited. How about you, Mark? Uh, no, not, not, nothing like this, but we've done like a video sort of podcast, so I don't know if that counts. Yeah, me, myself and Mark, we've both done kind of like, it was more of like a for fun, just kind of seeing how it goes, but not like a... It's more like a vlog format, but however, it's, we, we can say it's a podcast because it's quite it's similar. It, it had video, so maybe you can call it a video podcast. Well, the fact is you haven't been on the Global Travel Channel podcast show before, right? I'm very honoured to be on the podcast, so thank you. So what we'll do is we'll start off with a... A random question for you guys that I ask most of my first timers, and that is, what's your favorite traveling snack food? All right, so I'll start. Uh, this is a bit, obviously Mark will know a bit about this, uh, but my favorite traveling snack food is a cucumber. <laughs> and whenever I leave the house to go on an adventure, I always stop at the supermarket to get myself a <laughs> full-size cucumber. And, and I eat that down. Yeah. How about you, Mark? Cucumber, that's uh, um, that's yeah. quite interesting. I've never had a cucumber told to me first. It, mostly it's chocolate followed by peanuts, but you top it out with a, a cucumber there, Grayson. I can eat a whole cucumber in one sitting, so pretty good. It, it's it's real hydrating, and I just like the crunchiness. Fantastic. But I also love a good chocolate bar too, so I'm not like a health addict or anything. <laughs> what about the other guys? Jordan, what's your favourite travelling snack food? Um, my favourite snack food whenever I go on a travel, like on a camping trip or anything like that is I'll often get a packet of up and go up and go what's that is that like cereal is it um no so it's made by sanitarium I know you've probably got wheat books over there yeah. um yeah and they make it's, it's actually like a kind of like a, oh, how do you explain it so not it's, a, it's a drink a liquid breakfast in a way so it's like milk and like flavored milk in a way uh, you must have energizer or something 
Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I'm sure. Look, I'm sure it exists, and I'm sure all the Aussie listeners are going to get on to me and tell me. Of course, we have it. It's not a not a third world country over here, and yeah, they I mean, do have sanitarium products here. So. And I don't just drink it for breakfast. I'll drink it at any time of the day. Any time <laughs> of the day. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, what about you, Mark? What's your uh, favorite traveling oh. snack food? Uh, okay. Well, in Asia, it's mangoes. Mangoes. Mm. Mm. I was yeah. just I was just thinking about the mango thing for a minute. Yeah, mangoes are my favorite, but since New Zealand is not really tropical, the most, I guess I bring my chocolate. That's my happy snack food. Chocolate as well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, cool. So we've got a couple of strange ones there, mangoes and cucumbers. We haven't had those before, so a couple of first timers there. We've got listeners in over 54 countries around the world, and I thought we'd give them a little bit of an introduction to New Zealand because you guys must know everything about New Zealand. So... I've got a bit of a rapid quiz here of about three questions I'm going to ask you and all yep. New Zealand related stuff. And one of them is even about your hometown. So you should get that right. The first question is how far you, maybe you can take uh, one of these each year. So each person can have a go at answering. Right. F- first one is who's going to, who's going to answer the first one. You want to nominate somebody? I'm going to nominate Jordan to answer the first one. Why do I get nominated for these? <laughs> all right. All right. I'm ready. I'm ready. They obviously think you're going to get it right, Jordan. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> So how far in kilometres is it from the top of New Zealand to the bottom of the South Island? Oh, I've got no clue at all. I'm going to guess about 3,500 kilometres. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to guess 2,000. I don't know the answer, but uh, I think it's <coughs> roughly about 2,000. No? 5,400. Okay, so guys, it's 1,600 kilometres from Cape Reinga oh. to Bluff, yeah? Wow, so that's smaller than I thought. Oh, okay. So, so I think that was <laughs> So it didn't start off too well. I'm sure there's a couple of Kiwis around the world that are probably beating themselves at the moment because they knew the answer to that. <laughs> so let's go on to let's go on to an easier question for you then. Right, okay, I'll answer the easy question. <laughs> All right, Grayson's next. It's a true or false, so you've got fifty percent chance of getting it right. So the question is New Zealand has more land surfaced area than the UK. True or false? Uh, I'm gonna say this is true. Uh, I've heard a few times that it's a similar size to the UK. I'm going to go with so true as well. And Mark? Yeah, true. Landscape. Three trues. Three very good yeah. guesses there. We've got it. We've got it correct. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I, actually, I actually saw a map showing the actual size of New Zealand in comparison to other countries recently, and it's actually showing that New Zealand's a lot bigger than it's usually shown on regular maps. So. Hmm. It actually blew my mind about that New Zealand's quite big. Yeah, the other interesting fact about that is that a lot of New Zealand's land mass area in the South Island in particular is taken up with mountains. So when you haven't got yeah. cities sprawled over everywhere, yeah. it's a little bit difficult to judge how much land mass is actually there. So, okay, yeah, you guys got that one right. Now for the last one, a little bit closer to home, I thought I'd give you one in your own backyard, see if you get it right. All right. Awesome. So you guys are from Tauranga, correct? Yep. Yeah. So you, so you must know what the exact height of Mount Monganui is. Right, Mark, you're going first on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, 900 meters. Oh, Mark, that is, that's, that's can, I, can I re-answer that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we often uh, climb the mount mm. all together, all mm. three of us. Mm. Um, and I'm pretty sure at the base there's a sign that tells you how high it is. And I've 262. Yeah, I was going to say 260 something. So, oh, my bad. Yeah. Well, before I before I get to the answer, I'm a little bit disappointed in the guy that made an actual YouTube video about Mount Monganui and he guessed 900 <laughs> meters. Yeah. So, I. Oh, oh Mark. That was also Mark's um, biggest and most viral video he's ever made. So Mount, Mount Monganui is actually 232 metres above sea level. Oh, 232. Yeah. You guys will never forget that. And in particular, Mark, you'll probably take note of that for your next video. <laughs> oh, oh, myself and Grayson were a bit closer, I guess. Oh, <laughs> God, Mark. Letting the team down. So now an opportunity for the listeners to get to know each of you individually a little bit. So I'm going to start off with Jordan. Jordan, I hear that your first overseas trip was to Rarotonga. Is that correct? That is correct, and that was earlier this year. So I'm 21 years old, and I had never been overseas until this year. Mm. So, yeah. So as you know, this is a travel podcast. So tell us about Rarotonga. Was it a good experience? I absolutely loved it. Um, it's 
so similar to New Zealand in many ways, but at the same time, completely different. Um, what I'm saying, about, what I mean by that is the language they speak there is called Cook Island Māori rather than like New Zealand Māori. So it's a very similar language, but there are slight differences. Like a lot of people might know that um, in New Zealand to say hello or a greeting in Māori is kia ora, but then in Rarotonga it's kia orana. So it's, a, it's very similar, but it's got, they've got their own way of saying everything. A lot of the forests and stuff there are also quite similar like there's actually a few of the same plants that grow there that grow in New Zealand but then there's also a lot of different wildlife as well hmm. also when you kind of just if you were there for if you were there to live like everyone that's there living there it's kind of um, a completely different lifestyle everyone's just so chill back everyone kind of just um, rides around the island on their scooters or their motorbikes with their helmets on and that's apparently okay for the locals um, if you're a tourist, you have to wear a, a helmet, though, so that's quite funny. A lot of people listening won't have any idea where Rarotonga is geographically, so can you give us an idea where it is in terms of some of the next big yeah. Pacific islands that are nearby? Um, if you've got New Zealand on a map and then you go halfway between New Zealand and Hawaii, that's pretty, pretty much bang in the middle is where Rarotonga is. Mm. And I think it's one of the more southern Cook Islands. And uh, you're talking about the accents. Could they actually understand you? Yeah, um, as soon as you talk, they're like, oh, you're a Kiwi. That's quite funny. How was that travel experience? Is it, is it something now that's ignited your, your desire to go off and see other parts of the world? Um, it, it definitely has. It's um, completely opened my mind to um, wanting to travel. And I've, I've made a, a goal to myself that I'm going to be going overseas at least once a year mm. uh, from now on. So I'll be going somewhere as well. I haven't decided where, mm -hmm. but I will be going somewhere next year. So tell me, what, what, what is it about travel that made that experience special for you? What, what are a couple of things that you took away from it that maybe changed you a bit as a person or the way that you see the world? Um, definitely the people. The people there are so nice. And I know that's the same with so many other travel experiences. I'm sure Mark and Grayson will have the same outlook from their travels as well um, in different parts of Asia and that. Um, but basically, when we were in Rarotonga, uh, we didn't have our own vehicle for about half of it. So after like halfway through, we rented our own vehicle. Um, but before that, we would just hitchhike everywhere. And because the island's just one big circle, it's literally one road going around the outside. You can pretty much just hitchhike to any part of the island and it doesn't take very long at all. And so many of the people are just so friendly and kind and you get picked up very quickly. And it's not just that they pick you up and they're friendly when they pick you up. Once you're in the car driving, you'll see that there's like a box of fruit in the back and they will offer you the fruit in the box that they've been growing in their own orchards and that sort of thing. They just kind of give it to you. Hmm. Um, one time, one of the times that we hopped in a car with someone, um, he had a big box and he gave us the whole box and we got to take that home with us. So that was quite funny, but very, it was very cool and very nice. I'm interested to know why you chose Rarotonga as your first travel experience overseas. Um, I'm not too sure. My, my mum was the one to to decide to go there and she kind of talked me into going going overseas with her because I'd never done it. But at the same time, she talked me into going, but then I had to pay for everything myself anyway. So yeah, but it was, I guess it was more her choice, but at the same time, I wasn't really that excited about travel in the first place, I guess. Um, before, I guess about two years ago, I was getting more um, open to the idea of traveling overseas because I'd been doing a lot of travel and adventuring around New Zealand. Um, but before that, I never really thought of it as being like a big deal or anything. I kind of thought it as um, it wouldn't be too much different to New Zealand. It's just kind of like you're still in the same world sort of thing. There's not really much more to it. But after doing it, it's just completely opened my mind. And I know that I've been missing out on a lot these past 21 years. <laughs> So just for people listening again, how, how far or how long does it take to get there from Auckland uh, to Rarotonga by flight? Um, it was a four hour flight. We go back, it was 22 hours actually. So we left at midnight on a Sunday and we arrived there on Saturday at two o'clock in the morning. Hmm. But it took four hours to fly there. So, hmm. so you actually almost got a new day uh, for your holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're into parkour and free running. Do you want to explain what parkour is to the people listening? Yeah. So parkour and free running is something that I've been doing for five years now. Um, 
I remember the first time I, um, basically what it is, is doing like flips and almost like gymnastics in a way, but more freestyle and kind of just doing it for yourself. It's not really like a competitive thing. You kind of go out and you do it in the streets. Um, so you don't really have like the padding and all that. It's more just, um, you may, like you, people have probably seen it on videos where people are doing like huge jumps and flips off buildings and that sort of thing. Um, it's not all just that. There's a lot of um, training and practice on low ground first just to get used to it and to learn how your body works and all that. I've been doing that for five years now. I remember the first time I actually decided I was going to start is because I was at I was at Mount Monganui with my friends and we came across a playground which had like a kind of squishy, springy um, floor to it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey guys, watch this. And I just ran, ran over and like tried to do a front flip and I landed flat on my butt mm. and it was the funniest experience. Everyone just laughed at me. And then from that point onwards, I was like, all right, that's going to be my next goal is to be able to land my feet. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how it all started. Do you see it being an Olympic sport one day? I believe there are talks about them trying to get it into the Olympics. Don't know, but it's not going to have the same sort of philosophy behind it as when, when it gets brought into that though. Um, I feel that because it's, kind of like a freestyle sport that's not it wasn't created to be a competitive sport mm. um, there are competitions already at the moment obviously but um even that kind of pushes the boundaries of what parkour and free running really is um because it's more just kind of something you go out and you kind of just play around with your friends and try new things it's never like something where you're actually like competing with the other people around you to see who can do what better. Yeah. Um, it's more like a collective thing. Everyone's working together and helping each other to learn. Right. Okay. Sounds like rugby union to me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, thanks for that. We're going to come back and talk more about your filming and, and uh, content creating shortly, but let's get to know Grayson now. Grayson, snowboarding, surfing, filmmaking, real estate photographer. You do a lot of stuff, mate, and you've got a film film company as well so tell us how all those things got started in your life so out of those hobbies that you just announced um my first one was filmmaking um and i started making films when i was about around 11 or 12 years old with a mate and it pretty much just grew from there so i've been making films about everything and anything since i was about that age uh -huh. um whether it be uh skateboarding <laughs> surfing snowboarding uh travel stuff drone videos weddings funerals even anything, real estate videos, vlogs, the whole lot. So I, I don't really have a, a certain niche when it comes to filmmaking. Um, and I also do documentaries, obviously. Do you and your mate into filmmaking? It's going back a while when, when phones didn't really have cameras on them, or um, well, not to the ability that they do now. So his parents actually had an old Canon camera, which we used to use. I, I just thought it was the most amazing thing. And I was so stoked that they actually had a camera that we could use mm -hmm. because you go back 11 years it wasn't really a household item to have something that takes video mm -hmm. and so all my life i've been a creator so no matter what it is if it's creative i love it i've been making music um, doing art anything creative building building stuff um, and i think that's where it starts from because with film um, i get the most pleasure out of producing creative videos yep um and yeah so back then with my friend we used to make lots of um lots of skits and comedy videos. Huh. And we also made a, a series called, um, I've forgotten what it was called, but it was about being home alone as a child and having to deal with all these like magical things that, that you find in the house. It was like four of us in this house, just kids, and there was no parents and we never explained <laughs> why. And we'd just walk around the house and we found this like, this crystal rock. Huh. And it had all these like super magical powers and all these strange things started happening and it started like, pursuing our bodies and just doing weird things and <laughs> we had a series of about five or six different videos oh. and during our seventh video we actually dropped the camera and smashed it oh, and no. broke it we dropped it dropped it on the tiles oh yeah so that's when we, we pretty much gave up at that point because <laughs> we had nothing to use and then about four or five years later I took media studies or film at school in college oh. and so i started using all their gear and it kind of sparked my passion again for film. And a few months later, I bought my own camera. Yeah, it's been, it's been going good ever since. We're going to get into a much deeper conversation about that shortly, but I want to get Mark in line now. So, Mark, you're originally from the Philippines, which is a beautiful country made up of thousands of islands. 
I read that you want to make people happy through your filming. Where does that philosophy come from? Uh, through my entertainment. So I wanted to be into performing arts. So that's through dance, dancing. That's mm. my background. Mm -hmm. Where I love to entertain. Uh, thought about being a comedian when I was little. Because I thought that was funny, but not really. <laughs> pretty, all my jokes are pretty dry. So, uh, yeah, I love entertaining. I love to make people laugh, smile. So I knew that through film and videos, I can make people feel a certain way. I can make a depressing video, make people sad if I want to. Uh -huh. Or I could make a funny video. And just, yeah, that's basically uh, what I love about video. It's all about um, being able to tell a story, whether it's a good story, bad story. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, cool. So how long have you lived in New Zealand for? 18 years. So yeah. I classify myself as a Kiwi, I guess. I have a New Zealand passport. Before we move on, Mark, I'm going to ask you, how high is Mount Maunganui? Two, 232 meters. <laughs> okay. uh, well, I've been listening. I don't mind listening. Not 900. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. so well done. Well, guys, thanks for that short intro. Now we're going to talk about a little bit more of travel at the moment. We, you guys are from, you're sitting in Tauranga in New Zealand at the moment. A lot of people listening to the show have got no idea where Tauranga is. So why don't, why don't you tell us where Tauranga is and tell us also what are the great things about Tauranga so people should come and visit. We actually call it Tauranga. Tauranga, okay. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a Māori word and they have their own way of um, pronouncing things. Rolling the R. But yeah, lo lots of Europeans say Tauranga, um, but you might hear us call it Tauranga and it's, it's the same same thing, same place. Um, anyway, Tauranga is in the North Island of New Zealand on the East Coast, about two thirds up. Um, and it's the fifth biggest city in New Zealand. Uh, it's on the coast. And it's known for known for its amazing beaches, surf beaches. And it's actually Mount Maunganui, which is the most, I would say, popular tourist place in Tauranga. Um, it's quite tropical, nice white sandy beaches, get, gets lots of tourism. And so, has it got a good uh, food scene as well for tourists that come and visit? Is there a lot of different types of cuisines to try, or is it mean just a lot of um, New Zealand type It's food. been getting better recently with some new shops opening up at the local mall Bayfair. And so Auckland has got like all these different food places and all their malls and that sort of thing. And a lot of those, a lot of those shops have started to slowly trickle down to Tauranga now. So that's only just started happening in this past year. Mark, yeah. are there any Philippine options uh, as far as food goes in Tauranga? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, it's all in Auckland. It's all in Auckland, okay. Okay, so for most tourists who are coming into New Zealand to visit, they're more than likely going to fly into Auckland. How far is it from Auckland by car down to Tauranga? All right, so it's about a three-hour drive mm -hmm. from Auckland to Tauranga. But most tourists that come here, they go straight to the South Island because that's probably the most beautiful part of New Zealand. Big, big snowy mountains and glaciers. There's a good, good snowboarding scene, skiing scene, and... Same mode, yeah, most of the tourists go straight down there to the South Island. I'd say for summer, I'd, I reckon we are at the best place. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, in terms of like a beach destination, I think. Yeah, I've heard that Mount Monganoi Beach is on the top 10 list of yeah. beaches in the world or something. It made it to the top 25. Top, top 25. Top 25. Yeah. And then I think last year we... It's definitely a place that people should come and check out, even if they uh, are heading to the South Island. Grayson, I'm not going to send this podcast to the Bay of Plenty Tourism Office based on what you just said about <laughs> everybody going directly to the South Island, but um, may, that, maybe... It's so funny, because I've actually, made a, I've actually worked with them on a couple of videos, so <laughs> I, should be, I should be promoting the hell out of them. Yes, you I should be. Made, um, yeah. I made one thing called the top five beaches in Tauranga. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, like... I. I agree, Tauranga is, or the Mount Maunganui is probably the nicest place in New Zealand for summer. Before you guys put your foot in it anymore with the Bay of Plenty Tourist Office, we'll move on to talking about filmmaking. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you guys on the show today was that you're, a, you're three young guys who have this passion for making and creating video content and yeah. also for making films. And I wanted to start off by asking you today, what is filmmaking these days? Because... Obviously, with the introduction of YouTube and a lot of other platforms that are out there today in the social media world, I think for filmmaking has changed over the years. So how do you guys actually see filmmaking today? Um, I see filmmaking as a way to showcase anything. So like back in the day, filmmaking was 
purely just making movies or advertising TV or TV shows, that sort of thing. But now it can be used for anything that you're in. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're doing or what kind of passions you have. Filmmaking is a way to communicate what you love or what you do to anyone. Video has been uh, proved to be the most consumed form of media. Um, so people watch more video hours than they do with pictures and text and other, other types of media. Um, and it's also the most engaging. So if somebody, if somebody reads something and then they look at a picture and then they watch a video, they're going to watch the video for longer and soak up more information than they would with the text and the photo. So that's really cool for us because, you know, we're not, we're not doing videos for the engagement possibilities. We're just doing it because we love it. And we've been able to make some pretty, some pretty cool videos with lots and lots of, I don't know, I'll say engagement or, or, you know, it's very easy to make a video and reach hundreds of thousands of people through platforms like Facebook or YouTube or Instagram. Yeah. And that's really cool for us because it's easier to get our, to get our creative outlet out there into the world, as mm. opposed to if we were just writing stuff or just taking photos. So yeah. So the storytelling aspect of filmmaking is important to you guys. Now, are you working on projects independently or are you working on projects together as well? Uh, so we are all individual creatives, uh, but we do collaborate in terms of when we go for road trips, for example, uh, we've done creative um, trips where we work along with business or um, weddings. weddings companies. So we are pretty wide in terms of what we do. So Grayson here works uh, for himself. So he's a freelancer, he does weddings um, from business shoots. Jordan's the same as well, uh, freelancing in terms of photography and video. Um, like myself, I've done weddings as well. Um, I try to keep it all versatile, so I don't focus on one genre. I focus on a lot of travel, but I do open up in terms of my freelance services out there. So I label, yeah, in terms of that, like that's, uh, we're pretty much individuals, but we do work together as a team. So if a person needs a help or a second shooter, I would volunteer or I would, he would contract me. But um, in terms of our group here in Tauranga, we do go out on trips or adventures where we create videos together for our own personal content. Um, but we do work individually most of the time. So we have our own individual names that we go, we go by, but uh, it is fun pretty much to work together as well because uh, it's easier when you work in a team. Hmm. Yeah. And how long have you known each other? Have you known each other since you were young kids or? No, so I've only known Mark for one year. Hmm. Um, and I've only known Jordan for about, I'm going to say, nine or ten months. Yeah, so I've known Mark for a little bit longer than Grayson's known Mark. I met him three years ago, two years, two and a half years ago, I think, um, when he was filming the Mount Monganoi video um, that was mentioned earlier. My brother knew anyone that did like cool flips or anything because he wanted to get some flips in his video, but he didn't know where to start. So he asked my brother, and my brother happened to know me, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. He connected us together and then ever since that kind of is what got me more into the filmmaking side as well because before that I was just doing, I was making films but it was just purely for my parkour and free running. So I'm, I'm interested to know what are the current projects that you've got on your radar at the moment? Let's start with you, Mark. I look up to a lot of people as well in terms of filming. So there's a person that I look up to and that's Taylor Card Films. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, basically, I learned a lot. Basically, I didn't go to film school. I learned a lot off YouTube or just watching a lot of videos. I taught myself, um, but I am inspired by a lot of um, other creatives. Like, I'm inspired by my friends. I'm inspired by people I've never met. But um, I was just said that I want to make videos like that. I want to do it. So sat down, learned for myself, and then within a year or two, I've improved a lot just by being active and since it's your passion, things you just learn so quick. Mm -hmm. And um, so I look up to everyone because uh, everyone that I've met, I've learned a lot of different things. For, for example, for Grayson, I learned trap, Jordan um, as well. For example, I, when I saw his sort of style of videos, I've learned a bit of, I guess, tips and tricks of how he edits his content. Um, but 
for myself though, I really look up to every filmmakers out there because um, everyone's got their own creative flow. So as much as I want to be creative, I'm still trying to figure out my own style. So any projects that I'm working on at the moment is I have my own travel brand focus. I go by the name of Mark My Travel. So that's my travel focus um, brand, personal brand, where I create vlog, vlogs, travel vlogs, or uh, just travel films. So that's my own personal content. And then I do go by the name of Mark Sandoval Films as well. So that's all my freelance work. That's where I do weddings and all that sort of stuff. But the projects I'm working on right now is my own content. So I just recently got back from Vietnam and Bali, and I am currently finishing and editing some work uh, for that. So um, working on that at the moment, um, but I'm also open for um, freelance work as well. So that's some passive income as well that comes in every now and then when I put my service out there. So yeah, that's that's me. So are you are you doing this full time at the moment? How are you funding these trips away to to do so these shoots? September last year, I left IT. Um, basically, my contract ended, so I've been freelancing for about almost a year. But I, there was about six months where I was uh, full time into this whole freelance slash traveling and, and all this. But I just had the savings to go by, but I had to have some sort of income. So when I was freelancing doing weddings, it was great during the summer, but I realized during the winter it was so hard because it's most of the jobs were all seasonal. So yeah, I struggle. Uh, I do struggle, but I really enjoy the process in terms of trying to survive and make me work harder in terms of what I want. Um, I do work casual now as well. So I do uh, work as a merchandiser, support worker. So that helps me um, on my travels. But at the moment, I'm actually working on a way to figure out how to sustain my travels. So that's by starting up um, networking. So when I went to Bali, for example, I always go there to network, to learn of others. And I'm also meeting other people who are who's already made it. So that means uh, collaborating with travel bloggers or collaborating with people who have done startups, business and all this. And I've learned a lot from them. And now all I have to do is just connect the dots hmm. and figure out a way how to really start this whole business thing going. Because online, as a creative, I think that's the outlet that I really want to go for. Um, at the moment, in reality, that, yeah, I travel a lot, but a lot of people don't know that, that it's not easy. Most people are too scared to try just because they don't want to go out of their comfort zone because they'd rather work at the money. Hmm. But for me, I've, I've made it work. I've survived over about a year where I only earn a certain amount of money. But since I'm dedicated and I know I want to travel, I will travel. Um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, at the moment I am fluctuating in terms of like travel money. So at the moment, uh, it's not easy, but when I do get sponsorships and things like that, uh, it kind of helps sometimes. But ideally, I still have to work. What have you learned about yourself through your travel experiences that you've had so far? Uh, so what I learned um, that since I started traveling about two years ago, probably, and I knew this is what I want, what I wanted to do. It was such a hard choice for me because I know that I have a degree or body behind my back that I can go and get a comfortable job. But what I learned is that uh, it's not easy, but it's something that I get excited about getting up every morning thinking about my mind, I'm quite a creative person. So when I look at a place or I listen to a song, I start thinking about video ideas. Sometimes I see someone walk past and I see that in slow motion, which is crazy. Through my journey in travel, I've learned that I, you just have to go with the, with the flow and sometimes travel isn't easy because things never work out for themselves. There are times when I've almost missed my flights. There are times where I missed the bus. And there are times where I go to a country they don't speak English and I just don't know what to do. <laughs> and things like uh, language barrier has always been fun. Hmm. Like, for example, going to Japan, I have no idea how to speak Japanese, for example, and I don't know, and I was stuck. So the travel experience is amazing because it made me realize that the world that we live in is a really big place through culture and all that. And I would not trade the time I've, ex I've spent overseas for anything else. I'm really happy and it's worth the money going overseas because those are experiences and memories that you will 
have for the rest of your life that you can tell once you once you get older. And all. yeah, I really love I really love the travel parts because as Jordan said earlier on, it really opens your mind in terms of um, how you see the world, uh, your perspective, and life changes as well because it teaches you more about yourself when you travel because you learn to trust yourself, you learn um, how to respect people as well because you know when you travel, it's about the it's not about the place as well. It's about the people. Huh. And for me, it's been my main home. Like I feel home when I'm traveling because home is where you're happy, you know? Huh. And uh, yeah, and all of this, I'm really thankful for the whole travel slash film because uh, these are the people I've attracted through my life. Like all this, uh, Grace and, and Jordan. If it wasn't for film or travel, I probably won't be here doing this podcast right now. But um, as you say, you do attract the people that... Uh, just follow what you do, you know, um, you will eventually find the people that you will click with, connect with. And yeah, I'm thankful for that. So the travel experience, I have to say, is fully amazing. Mm. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, Grayson, what's your, what are you currently working on? Okay, so I'm currently working on a couple of videos. Um, <clears throat> I recently went to Vietnam with, with my girlfriend and with Mark and with a couple of other creators and friends. And... So pretty much I didn't actually want to take any film gear with me, no cameras, no nothing. And that was because I've, just before I went, I've been working tirelessly on this documentary. And I kind of just wanted this trip to be all about relaxing, meeting new people, finding new places, experiencing new experiences. Um, because when I went to Vietnam, it was actually my first time outside of New Zealand and Australia. Huh. So it was, it was a pretty big deal, to be honest. So when I went to Vietnam, I didn't take any film gear. Which sounds crazy because I should be wanting to capture every moment, um, and I did because my girlfriend has a GoPro, um, <laughs> the, the newest GoPro. Uh, we took that with us, um, and I, I thought, yeah, that's cool because I can put it in your pocket. It's tiny, it's so versatile. You can put it anywhere. You can drop it, you can put it in water, um, and it, it captured every moment of our trip. And there was no hassle involved. So I put together a video about that, and I'm just slowly breaking up the best parts. I'm also working on a snowboarding video. Uh-huh. Well, actually, I just I finished that about an hour ago for this podcast. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm really only working at the moment on the Vietnam trip. Where does the funding come for you in terms of putting some of those projects together? It is all 100% off your own budget, or have you got people helping you out in that area? Uh, yeah, so it's 100% off my own budget. Obviously, I do produce films that are paid for. All of these travel videos are, are paid for by us. And... Yeah, we have no issue doing that because we're not we're not necessarily going spending thousands of dollars going across the world to make a video. Um, we're doing it for the love of travel, and I think I think it's okay to spend your own money. Yeah, when you're doing it, the things you love. Are there options low like funding grants and things like that in New Zealand for young videographers and filmmakers that want to get into it in a serious you know serious mode like you guys are? Yeah, absolutely, there is. Um, you've got to be a world class. I think the, the, the best way to to get funding for traveling is to be a presenter, to be a presenter and a filmmaker. So you've got to be a very entertaining, confident, engaging person on camera, and you've got to have the editing skills to back it up. So for me, I don't I don't have that yet. Um, I don't really do any kind of vlogging, but I've done one or two. But vlogging, vlogging and being in front of the camera is an entirely new skill set to anything else. So. Mark Sandoval here, he's done, I think, up to like 50 vlogs, which is crazy, and his progress is just astounding. And so obviously that's that's his inspiration, that's his passion. He wants to be a full-time travel filmmaker, vlogger, it's called Influencer, and that's what he's working towards with his Mark My Travels. Mm-hmm. Last, year was a, last year was such an incredible journey for me because this is when I connected with uh, Grayson um, and other, other creatives. And Jordan, who I connected with through my videos, and I know that um, the journey is amazing, and I don't think I'll ever stop in terms of being creative because I know that I'm in work in progress, and I just don't want to stop because I know that the reward's great. Mm. You said behind the camera is your thing at the moment. Is that where you want to stay, or do you want to get out in front of the camera? Um, yeah, so pretty much up until now, I've only been behind the camera and behind the computer. Um, but in the last few months I've, I've appeared in many more videos and in fact 
In fact, my my last my uh, sorry second to last video about the Vietnam um, was the first video where I'm actually talking to the camera a fair bit. Yep. And it is hard. It's very hard to stay on topic when you're just pointing your camera at yourself and talking to it. Hmm. And it's very hard to stay confident. And it's very hard to keep to keep the entertainment levels up too. Hmm. Um, but it definitely takes practice. Something Mark's got. Something that Mark's got figured out. Just push myself to the limits and really put myself in front of the camera more and more. Um, obviously, because there are so many more opportunities in film when they can put a face to the name yep. and they can, and when people get to know you, not only as a person who made the film, but as who you are as a person. How about you, Jordan? What's your inspiration and what are you working on at the moment as far as content um, creation goes? My inspiration. Um, I obviously started, when I started doing parkour and freerunning, I decided I want to kind of show people what I'm doing. So I started just like kind of setting my phone up and filming myself doing the different things that I was learning on that day and make little compilation videos. And I, um, that was pretty much the start of my filmmaking is I've literally filmed different tricks that I did and I've compiled them all together and just put some music in the background and I've, I've called that a day. That was my videos. and. I did that all just on my phone. So I just had like a phone editor. I think it was called Viva Video or something. Um, and that was me for about three, two or three years, I think, until I met Mark and we made that video of Mount Monganui. And when that blew up, it kind of opened my eyes that um, what I've been doing with my parkour and free running videos is I can like, there's, that's not like the limit for me. Like that's all I really saw for myself before that because that's kind of all I knew because everyone else that I was hanging out with, I guess they were all like people that were doing parkour and free running as well. So that was all they were making as well. Mm. Um, once I met Mark, it kind of opened my eyes and I realized that filmmaking and filming in general can be used for so much more than just, um, one single thing. So he was using that to showcase our beautiful home and it made me realize that I could do something similar and, and I kind of just started from that point. I think the first video I made after that myself and Mark went on a road trip up to Auckland and visited the beaches there and filmed the sunset and that sort of thing. So that was like my first, um, video that I, I think I ever made that didn't have anything to do with my flips, but I, I, I still do put my flips in my videos every so often. Like I'll kind of, chuck it in there, but that's more like a splash of excitement that I put in, like when the music is sort of an exciting part or that sort of thing. So I still, I still incorporate a little bit of my past, um, my past stuff into my current videos as well. Basically how I got inspired to get more into the filming travel and adventure side of filmmaking. And just recently I started filming vlogs as well. So I think Mark was probably one of my inspirations for that just because he was, he was vlogging first. So I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of cool. So I'll give that a go. Um, my first two vlogs, I think I never released because I was embarrassed. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because like, obviously I, I was very awkward talking to the camera and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and then I think my third vlog was a video I, I vlogged of my workplace, which is, I used to work at a trampoline park called Flipout, and I made a vlog there, just kind of us all hanging out. And it was more like my old flipping style of videos, but it had me talking to the camera as well. So that was like my first ever vlog. I think I released for people to see. Hmm. And I think something that Mark mentioned, he was saying that, um, when you realize your first like couple of videos, they only get a couple of views. And it makes you feel bad. I was like the complete opposite of that. I was so happy that my video didn't get many views. <laughs> I was still like not sure what people were going to think of me. Like it's something like, I don't know, like a self image thing or something like, cause it's, there's still like a, a negative stigma behind vlogging and all. Like if mm -hmm. you talk to someone that isn't, that doesn't vlog or doesn't know people that vlog and, and you mention that you vlog or something or, or they see someone vlogging, they're like, oh, he's vlogging. Like, what the heck? Like they see it as a weird thing. Mm. And mm. myself, I think that's like a very hypocritical thing to say, because 
my bet is that 99% of those people that look at people weirdly when they vlog probably go home that night and watch YouTube videos of people vlogging. <laughs> um, but they just they think it's a weird thing when they see it in real life, I guess. Mm. Um, since then, I have gotten a lot more confident in front of the camera doing vlogging because I um, I made a goal to myself that I was going to make one vlog each week for 10 weeks, and I managed to pull through with that. I did that for 10 weeks straight. Um, and I ended up actually making about two or three videos a week instead, um, somehow. Mm. I don't know how I managed to make so many videos, but mm. um, that was all right before I went to Rarotonga. I kind of timed it perfectly that my last video of after 10 weeks would, um, I would, I filmed that like the day before I flew out to Rarotonga. So yeah, and I've made a couple videos since then. And I found that my two week break in Rarotonga gave me a little bit of rest and when I came back I was kind of even more comfortable in front of the camera and um, I guess just more eager to get out and make more videos just because I had a bit of a break hmm. and yeah. Now Grayson I came across you online somewhere I found a video of yours that you made about Mount Messenger area in New Zealand which is in the North Island and not too far from my hometown of New Plymouth. I'm interested to know what inspired you to go to that part of the world and do that video. That video was made for a guy called Russell Gibbs. Um, he's my biggest client and I go down there a few times a year to produce different videos for the guy. He's actually Jordan's um, great uncle. Second uncle. I think. Yeah, he's yeah. actually, he's Jordan's second uncle. And we only found this out about a month ago mm. when I was mentioning <laughs> Russell Gibbs. So crazy stuff yeah. there. But anyway, I've been, I've been doing work for Russell Gibbs for... We're all related in New Zealand, by the way. I said we're all related in New Zealand. <laughs> oh, I know. We're all embryo. Um, <laughs> I was hired to produce a documentary for Russell Gibbs about um, a roading bypass that is planning to be going through Mount Messenger. Um, so Mount Messenger is a, a beautiful a beautiful part of rural Taranaki, North Taranaki. Um, it's it's hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds of, a of acres of native untu untouched bush, home to many, many species of endemic animals, birds, eels, crayfish, trout, pretty much, pretty much every species in New Zealand, plant and animal that are threatened or near extinction lives and thrives in Mount Messenger. NZTA and other companies are planning to put a, a highway right through the middle, pretty much destroy a huge portion of that sacred bush. Um, and this, this documentary was pretty much, um, so I filmed a couple called named um, Tony and Debbie Pascoe, uh -huh. and they live right in the heart of Mount Messenger, directly in the way of this proposed bypass. So they are the only people that have been asked to, to leave their home um, to move so they can put this bypass in. So they are deeply affected by the bypass. Uh -huh. So the film was, was on them and on, them, on their opinions. Um, so I interviewed them, made, made a short documentary about what this bypass is gonna do to the environment and all the political, all the political jargon involved as well. Mm. In that. So how did you like that part of New Zealand? Oh, to be honest, it was the most beautiful experience I've ever had in terms of nature. Like I've, I walked through their valley twice while filming this documentary. And like I've done, I've done tons and tons of bush walks and in different nature walks ar around New Zealand. But this was definitely the most um, stunning for me. Um, and I think it's because nobody really goes through there because it is private property and it's untouched and there's like every every native species of plant and there are there's streams running through and it's just bliss and it's peaceful yeah it's a really really nice place ah. yeah so for everybody who's listening today and you're planning a trip to New Zealand I'd highly recommend that you don't do what Grayson said earlier and head to the South Island straight away there's plenty of things to do in the North Island with the Bay of Plenty in the North Taranaki area. There's some beautiful spots in New Zealand and Forgotten Highway. Um, there's, a, there's a magnificent drive down through the central part of the North Island of New Zealand coming out of a town called Stratford which is just at the base of Mount Taranaki and uh, there really is some spectacular parts. Guys we've, we've rushed through the show today but before I go I want to I want to get from each of you what your goal is in the next few years with your filmmaking and content creation ambitions. So let's start off with you, Jordan. Don't really have like a huge ambition of what I want to do at the moment because I still need to decide what my 
my niches. Like I still make so many different styles of videos. Like I make vlogs or I make um, traveling videos or just like adventure videos. Um, my flipping, free running, and parkour videos as well. Um, I need to I need to just decide which one of those I want to like which path I want to go down. And it's an undecided stage of where I want to go with my filmmaking. Okay, cool. Grayson, what about you? All right, so my main goal in the next five to 10 years is to be a full-time self-employed documentary filmmaker. Um, and I want that to be mainly focused on environmental issues as well. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so it's pretty pretty niche niche subject. And yeah, I, I really like having a positive impact on the environment whilst following my passion and making films at the same time. So it's a win-win. Mark, what about you? All right, so for me, uh, goal setting for myself is uh, I made some short term and long term, but uh, for me, I figured out my niche, and that is to focus on my my, my travels because that's exactly the path that I am going for, and basically the the steps I'm going to take to reach the goal. Uh, my goals are basically my goals are to sustain myself, and that's uh, basically as I said earlier on, and that is to have passive income online and that is through different different platforms i guess whether it's uh making income through um, partnerships maybe um, brand endorsement or maybe even through uh online business that i may have one day that's related to travel so uh, at the moment for the rest of the year what i'm trying to do is uh learn more about the business side of things because that's a totally different skill set to have in terms of how business work how affiliate marketing even works or things like that that i want to learn and incorporate my films and how to sustain my travels because that's something that uh most people struggle with as well with this line of work because uh for me it's quite confusing path uh, confusing path for me but for short term of course i just want to keep doing what i'm doing just be consistent in terms of my creating content and therefore next year and the next year of course to see this, to see more of the world so i want to travel more so that's the main goal for the future is to figure out how to take that big step ahead and create a big change because at the moment i'm comfortable at the moment being back in new zealand and now i need to figure out how to take that big step okay that's great thanks for sharing that with us guys what i want to get you to do is send me a link to some of your work that you want to have promoted around the world and i'll put that up on our various platforms so people can get to see some of the things that you've been talking about today mark your your mount monganui video is great and um, if you want to get that out there a bit more then send me that and i can uh, post that up and grace and jordan the same thing as well why don't you send me a link to some of your work so that i can help promote it across the world for you awesome thank you very much Guys, it's been fantastic having you on the show today. The time's gone extremely fast, but we've got a bit of an insight as to your passions for filmmaking, and I'm sure everybody has really enjoyed listening to that. Also, you've done a pretty good job in publicizing some nice places in New Zealand, even though that took us a little bit while to get going on that one, Grayson. (laughs) Yeah, sure did. (laughs) We we were all looking at Grayson as you started to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks very much for joining me on the Global Travel Channel podcast show. Very keen to have you back either collectively or independently in the future after you've done some more of your traveling with video production and stuff so you can share that with my audience. We wish you all the best with your dreams for the future. Awesome. Awesome. Thank Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, guys. Thank you, Mark. So that's the end of my chat with Mark, Grayson and Jordan over there in the beautiful Bay of Plenty area of the North Island in New Zealand. And if you'd like to find out more about our podcast episodes, you can go over to our website at www.globaltravelchannel.com. There you will find a whole list of our episodes, or you can download them from Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, just to name a few. So that's it for this episode. My name is Mark Philpot, and until next time, I wish you all Bon voyage.